Broadcast. Welcome uh, back to I Dry Needle to the Point. Hard to believe we're already on episode five. And I guess an update even from previous weeks is that we are now live on iTunes. So Apple, on Google Podcasts, on Spotify. You can always get the video version on our YouTube channel afterwards. But this is episode five. And honestly, our guest today was one of the first clinicians, first people I reached out to when we were launching this um, podcast series, and I've been looking forward to it ever since. Uh, Our guest today is Sue Felsone. I'm sure you've heard of her. She is a PT. She also has her board certification in sports through the APTA. She's an ATC, um, a CSCS, a certified orthopedic manual therapist, also a registered yoga um, teacher but she's really known as the owner and founder of Structure and Function Education. They do dry needling, but also have online courses. Uh, Felsone Consulting, and she's also an associate professor with the athletic training program at AT Still. So Sue, thank you so much for being here. If there's anything I missed, please introduce yourself. No, that sounds like a mouthful. I appreciate the kind introduction and the kind words, so thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. I've been looking forward to this since we started, but I've also been dreading it. If you haven't caught previous episodes or don't get the point of to the point, my challenge personally is to keep these clinical discussions to 15 minutes. I've been moderately successful and I will not be the person to cut Sue Felsone off if we get on a topic that keeps going. Oops. But trying to narrow the topic for Sue was a challenge. So I kind of dove into a topic of athletic performance, athletic recovery, and specifically how she uses dry needling in that realm. Um, But Sue, before we even dive into that, I ask most of our guests this, but you probably have the most intriguing answer, I would assume, as far as uh, our listeners wanting to know, what was kind of your dry needling birth story? How were you exposed to it? When were you trained? And kind of how did you start to assimilate it into your practice? Yeah. Um, yeah, everybody kind of has that story, right? Um, you know, it had to have been 10 years ago um, before I, or I think I was working with the Dodgers at the time, actually. And um, Erwin Valencia, who was with the Pittsburgh Pirates at the time, he's currently with the New York, uh, New York Knicks. Um, we were good friends and we were chit chatting and he's like, Hey, I've been taking these needling classes and, you know, I think you'd really like it. You should get into it. And I'm like, Oh, I didn't even know that was something we could do. And so, you know, I looked into it and, and, um, did some private training um, with a man named Dr. Ma very, very long time ago, 10 years ago. Um, and yeah, that's kind of how I started, you know, um, like I said, thanks to Erwin for kind of introducing me to the modality as a whole. So a decade ago, for those, some of you out there who are just now first being exposed to it, I'd say we're definitely getting much closer to it being mainstream. But yeah, I love asking that question, especially to someone uh, like Sue, um, because it was a much different story a decade ago as far as the prominence and uh, even the availability of instruction. So to kind of dive into the topic, first of all, you have uh, a very popular book called Bridging the Gap. I actually even saw today that Structure and Function launched uh, a new online course also called Bridging the Gap. So how about you just tell the listeners, what does bridging the gap mean? Yeah, you know, for me, I really have spent uh, a large portion of my career in that space where maybe the athlete is no longer on the table, they've got full range of motion, they have five out of five strength, but they're certainly not ready to return to the field. And so I think during my time with athletes performance, I was with, um, they're now known as Exos. I was with them for 13 years and, you know, just really saw that general therapy ended and performance began. And there was this huge gap between the two, right? Like just because someone can do um, a six inch step up doesn't mean they're ready to return to the offensive line. And so as clinicians, how do we get more comfortable 
preparing our client or our athlete or our patient or our human, right? All of those words mean the same thing to me. Um, how do we get that person back to exactly what they want to do? And, you know, I think getting clinicians comfortable with concepts of strength and conditioning is really important. Um, and making friends and spending time in the weight room and really understanding what strength coaches do is really, really important to me. I became a much better clinician the more I started hanging out with strength coaches because I was able to prepare my clients way more um, to return to play than I was in the past, right? So understanding and getting comfortable with different sets and rep schemes, um, six sets of one versus three sets of 10, learning and understanding load. Uh, you know, I think a lot of times in the clinic, most clinics don't have greater than 20 pound dumbbells. So, you know, prescribing somebody and progressing someone on how to use 75, 80 pound dumbbells, or even 200, 300 pound barbells for squatting, right? That's difficult for a clinician. And so really just kind of working to, to bridge that gap that way. And then the other way too, you know, so many strength coaches and personal trainers get into the field to work with healthy people. And what they find is that because of our healthcare system, um, oftentimes injured people are winding up in the gym because they've exhausted their medical benefits. So, you know, a lot of strength coaches are really working with injured people and that's not what they signed up for. So how do we get the strength coach and the personal trainer feeling more comfortable with tissue tolerance and injury. So, you know, getting, getting people to sort of sing, you know, we are the world and hold hands together on both sides of the rehab and performances is really just been an important passion for me. Um, and then, you know, same thing with, with the, with athletic training and, and emergency care and, and some of those things that, that I developed, um, uh, those skills that I developed as an athletic trainer, as a physical therapist and strength coach, you know, for me, those letters really blend, you know, one doesn't end and the other begin. And so, you know, just kind of getting comfortable with people, um, getting people comfortable with blending all of that together, I think is really a passion. That's awesome. And I would second that. I think if there's any, um, pride component on why a physical therapist would never have like a very open, direct parallel communication with a fitness professional or a strength coach. Um, you should table that because I have learned a ton. I think it, it does make a more symbiotic uh, return to sport, or even if we're not talking athletes, your patient, uh, when they get that discharge out of your outpatient clinic, uh, there's a lot more to do. And whether you're directly involved, whether you know enough about everything Sue just said with the programming, or you just have that relationship with that professional outside the doors. Um, I think that bridging the gap makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, to put some focus on the dry needling specifically, you mentioned your role with the Dodgers. Um, I know you've had other roles and you've really worked very closely with these very elite athletic populations. So when it comes to needling, um, how does your needling look specifically different or how is it a little more tactical for let's even say for a recovery benefit or more of a, to improve athletic performance. Yeah. You know, I think when you start your needling career, you kind of go into it thinking it's about sticking needles and muscles. And over time you realize it's not at all about sticking needles and muscles or a very little part of it is about that, right? Like, yes, there's obviously local changes that are occurring and there's biomechanical things that are occurring and things that we know that the needle does um, through piezoelectrical effects of fascia or through mechanotransmission transduction and scar tissue and sort of all those local things. So I don't mean to say that there's no local effects. Of course there are. There's a lot of really cool local effects. There's some fantastic segmental effects as well from a segmental um, pain control standpoint. Um, and um, a systemic, the systemic effects are really um, what I think over time I have started to realize the power of. Um, and so when I say it's not about sticking needles and muscles, I just mean to say that it, there's so much more than the local effect. There's your segmental effects and your systemic effects as well. And when we start applying the needles as a modality to um, athletes specifically when it comes to recovery or regeneration, 
it's really these systemic effects that, that we're going after. And how do we bias the autonomic nervous system towards um, sympathetic tone or towards parasympathetic tone? And how do we utilize that concept? Um, you know, where we put the needle matters, what we do with that needle matters, right? Like it's not just about where, but it's what we do with the needle when it's in the body. And so how do we use different techniques in order to bias the autonomic nervous system one way or the other? And so for me, utilizing the needles with my clients um, in a recovery fashion is, is really about that, is, is how do we tap into some of those systemic effects for pain control, for recovery, for autonomic nervous system balance, um, and you know for sleep and all of those sort of really good things that kind of come along with tapping into the parasympathetic system for these guys who really live in a sympathetically stimulating kind of space. <laughs> yeah. Well, first, thank you for describing my path as a dry needling clinician. I was, I still remember when I first started using it, just so enamored by the twitch. I was really good at explaining local oxygenation and kind of that biochemical accumulation that we just improved. But um, I'm a few years behind you, obviously, but I completely agree is that now maybe the needling doesn't look that much different. Maybe it does, but the explanation or the understanding of where those changes come from um, can't be just peripheral. And honestly, they can't just be spinal level. It is the autonomic nervous system. It is uh, the cortex, like the governor of everything, our central nervous system. So totally agree with that. Um, yeah, sticking with, can, oh yeah. I was just gonna say, you can really start to nerd out on um, the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology of everything that's getting released systemically in different parts of the brain. And, uh, you know, our director of research and education, Brian Hortz, um, you know, I almost failed out of PT school because of physiology. So hire for your weaknesses. Brian has a PhD in physiology. <laughs> uh, so he and I really kind of nerd out on all of that stuff. And, and it is fun to, to look at how needles work in, in a much more systemic fashion. Yeah. We've met a few times. I don't know if you know how nerdy I am, but I was a <laughs> biology undergrad, but it's funny because my worst grade uh, my worst undergrad grade was biology 105, that very first course. And that became my, my path is biology. But I knew so I wanted fun. to do PT. Like I never wanted to wind up in a lab, pipetting, anything like that. And I follow okay. Brian on social. He's a brilliant mind. I like the way he talks about needling as well. Yeah. Yeah. We're lucky to have him. Um. Another specific question to kind of your athletic clientele. I know you have experience. We mentioned the Dodgers. So obviously baseball, maybe more throwing athletes. You've worked with the U S men's soccer team. I'm sure you've worked with athletes of other sports. Um, I know this is very general and if I need to focus it more, I can, but how do you use needling more specifically for specific uh, tasks or just specific athletic populations? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. You know, I am um, I'm lucky to have seen the in season aspect of really every sport except the NHL. You know, I've done some consulting in the NFL. Um, the majority of my clients right now are NFL clients. I've consulted and traveled with an NBA team as well. And so, you know, having the inside look at four different leagues, really, if you count international soccer as one of them as well, it's really interesting because so many things are different and yet so many things are exactly the same. And so, <laughs> you know, I think the, the first is, is that, you know, these, these things are stressful, you know, these guys are, they're traveling. We have three time zones in this country, which internationally, you know, if you're traveling internationally, that's a whole nother gig. Um, but, you know, other countries aren't used to that. Like the fact we have three time zones in this country alone is difficult on, on athletes from a travel perspective, from a sleep perspective, from an eating perspective. Um, and so, you know, the game schedule, baseball, you know, and they've altered this since I was in baseball, but you know, when I was there, it was 162 games in 183 days. So, you know, now I think they give them a few more recovery days, but um, not many. And so, you know, it's a long game. It's a long haul, whereas football is as intense as it can be one time a week. Uh, you know, they're just getting into a car accident every Sunday. And then, um, you know, then factor in your Thursday night and Monday night games. And all of a sudden, sometimes they got to recover really fast. And then, you know, basketball, sometimes it's two days on, one day off, one day on. 
one day off, two days, you know, like their schedules. So all over the place. So um, I think the biggest challenge, especially in an in-season situation is sort of managing their recovery based on their competition schedule. And so really kind of making sure, right? Like if you do some type of a needling technique with someone in season and it makes them sore, that's not going to go over well if they've got to perform the next day at the highest level. Um, so, you know, being very mindful of your technique of your patient, how they respond, right? Like we have to, every patient is an individual. So how does your athlete your client respond to the needles um, makes a big difference. If they're super exhausted after you're done needling them, because you've really tapped into the parasympathetic and they've got to go practice. Again, that's not a good thing, right? I want to do things pre-game or pre-practice that are more sympathetically stimulating versus parasympathetically stimulating after the game before they go to bed. So these are all things, again, that the more you understand the neurophysiology of needling um, and what different techniques and what different locations of needle placement Um, does, then you can better apply this to your clients. In the off season, you know, things in the off season are just a bit easier. You can take a day off or you can manage load or you can do what you need to do. But yeah, if you're needling people in season, there's, there's a lot to consider there um, versus, Hey, I'm just going to start putting needles in people every day. (laughs) You really got to kind of think out what you're doing time of day, competition, practice, the whole gig. That makes sense. And that sounds challenging. <laughs> <laughs> it is definitely challenging, but that that's that's the art of what we do, right? And that that's what makes it fun. And um, you know, really kind of tapping into helping these guys reach their full potential um, in you know in an ethical way is is really what what it's all about. The art and the science. It is a combo. <laughs> We have time for one more question. And again, I apologize that this is very broad, but if you were to give one piece of advice to our listeners, and let's just say a more novice dry needling clinician, um, working with this athletic population we've been talking about, what's that one thing you'd give them walking out the door today? Yeah, my biggest advice to um, young needlers um, is to know your anatomy. I mean, accidents happen when you don't know your anatomy. And if you are unsure of what could potentially be on the other side of your needle, don't insert a needle into it. And there's no shame in saying, you know what, I want to review that anatomy or I'm going to write like there's no emergent needling that needs to be done. So you can always double check anatomy, double check what, what you want to do. Um, prior to doing it, like I said, accidents happen when when people are have the wrong angle. They're inserting the needle um, in a place where they shouldn't be based on on their level of education. You know, there's no dangerous points. There's just inappropriate levels of education. So you know, making sure that your education level matches with what you're attempting to do, and the and the understanding the core morbidities and how that can can play. Um, set yourself up for success. You know, start start with the easy ankle sprains. Don't start with the person who has a list of ten medications and ten core morbidities, and you know. <laughs> set yourself up for success and, uh, and know your anatomy, no doubt. That's excellent. Um, yeah, I couldn't have said it better. And that is our (laughs) time every week. I'm so amazed how 15 minutes goes by so quickly. So I'd like to formally invite you back, um, once a month for the next year. (laughs) I know you're very busy, but no, your time here um, means a lot to us. First of all, you can follow at Structure and Function, all spelled out, no spaces, on social media. You can follow at Sue Falsone, F-A-L-S-O-N-E, um, on Instagram and the socials. Um, you can look for live and online courses for Structure and Function coming uh, to anywhere near you. I know you guys go all over the US. Uh, otherwise, if you see Sue at a conference or if she's speaking, I highly recommend uh, attending because you'll learn a lot and she puts this needling in such a wonderful context. So Sue, thank you again for your time. 
Oh, uh, my pleasure. Thank you so much. He's getting restless. I thought we were going to make it through a Zoom meeting without Richard, a, uh, you did great. <laughs> yeah, he did really good. He always makes an appearance one way, shape or form. I thought we were going to make it out without him uh, uh, wiggling off, but that's I'm not actually good. glad he didn't bark because I can hear mine <laughs> scratching at the door. So that would have started a whole like <laughs> online ruckus. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Once one gets going, they all get going. So. Yeah. Well, right, thank folks. you for having me on and thank you for the kind words. I very much appreciate of course. it. Thank you for coming. Uh, that's it for today, folks. Next week uh, is November and we have Jeff Moore from Institute of Clinical Excellence. Honestly, there might be a little infusion of dry needling, but if you ever met Jeff, it'll be all big picture. Where are we uh, currently with PT and where are we going? So you won't want to miss that. Thanks again, Sue. Um, and we'll see you all next week. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.